Brad, I'm going to turn to you. Is there a conceptual framework that you use to approach um, the diagnostic process or you would recommend? Yes, I think um, we've talked already about a, a complex array of, of terms that often are used to describe people's diagnosis. And uh, for some years, I, I have um, had patients come back to my office after going through the diagnosis and say, well, you, last time you told me I have two diagnoses. I have a progressive aphasia and I also have Alzheimer's disease. And so I think uh, we and others in the field have been working for some uh, recent years to try to organize that in a way that's a little more understandable, both to ourselves and to our patients and families and constituents. And currently, I think we um, advocate for a, a three-step framework, which starts by describing the person's overall cognitive functional status, which what we mean by that is mild cognitive, does the person have mild cognitive impairment? Does the person have dementia? Um, maybe they don't even have mild cognitive impairment. Maybe they have some subject, subjective cognitive decline that they feel that they're experiencing. And, and um, when Dr. Shaughnessy tests them, uh, they perform normally on neuropsych tests. So at the beginning, I think we, we, we don't always need neuropsychology. I think what we really need to do is interview the person and ideally an informant and find out what are they uh, lacking in terms of independent functioning. What have they lost? What do they need help with? Getting back to what Mark and, and Mary were just talking about, this ultimately has major implications for the care plan. So establishing whether the person has mild cognitive impairment or dementia is very important. And I think that threshold uh, varies from person to person and can be quite an arbitrary decision that really takes some clinical experience. Ultimately, what I like to ask people is, um, if, if you as the care partner can leave the person uh, and go on a trip for a weekend or a week, uh, would they function independently at the things that they need to try to get done in order to get by in daily life? If the care partner says, no, I would never do that, um, you can be pretty comfortable that the person probably has crossed the threshold into dementia. Um, so I think that's the starting point, number one. Number two is, what's the particular cognitive behavioral syndrome that the person is, uh, is experiencing? And this gets back to what Lily was talking about before in terms of, is the main problem memory loss? Is the main uh, problem executive function? Uh, is the main problem language? Are there multiple problems? So a lot of times we see, I think, this common presentation of a person that's got memory loss. They're just not holding on to information and they also have executive dysfunction. They're not able to reason, they're not able to perform um, tasks to the level that they used to be able to do uh, in order to get the job done, to reach goals in a, in a valid way. So I think that, that the syndrome is really meant to uh, capture the major symptoms and signs that the person has of their illness. And that really uh, communicates important information to uh, our colleagues and to uh, the patient and family about where their uh, problems are. I think it also uh, really uh, allows you to highlight, as Mark said before, what their strengths still may be. So if this person has a primary uh, memory loss syndrome, but their executive function is still good, um, maybe they can make use of strategies to compensate for some of the problems that they're having with memory. If they have executive dysfunction, they're probably not going to be able to do that. So um, ultimately, that cognitive behavioral syndrome, that second level of specificity in our diagnostic formulation, uh, communicates in shorthand to us and, and to others what the person's uh, problems are and, and, and maybe what they can still do. And then the third level is, what's the brain disease uh, that is the cause of the problem? Sometimes it's multiple diseases. Often it's compounded by other medical problems or, or things like medication effects that affect brain function but are not necessarily a disease in and of itself. So the most common, I think, is uh, as we're talking about Alzheimer's disease mixed with cerebrovascular pathology in an older adult population, people over the age of 70, 75. In the younger people, I think it can sometimes be a more pure uh, condition, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal degeneration or Lewy body disease. Um, those can often be um, primary diseases, especially in younger uh, people. So that's really the three-step uh, formulation that we uh, advocate that we try to follow. It's not always possible to be 100% uh, confident in any one of those levels, and I think that's where we have to talk about uh, likely due to Alzheimer's disease or uh, likely due to cerebrovascular disease. Uh, and really rate our level of certainty so that we can think about, do we need some additional 
specialty involvement? Uh, if so, how, what does that uh, uh, involve and, and how important is that in thinking about the management? It, we don't necessarily have to have the sophisticated biomarkers that we talk a lot about in every individual with dementia likely due to Alzheimer's disease. I think there are plenty of people that, that we could all diagnose with fairly straightforward assessments and tests and not do the multi-million dollar workup on that we often spend time talking about in the more specialized cases.